Well, welcome back to the After Hours Podcast here at Midwest Whitetail. We're bringing you episode five, and as it stands at recording, it is 12, 12 at night here. We just got done recording this a couple of hours ago, so trying to get this turned around as fast as possible, whether you're watching here on YouTube, listening, we appreciate you taking the time to join and tag along, and hopefully this one is something that you take some key points away. We're joining Gavin Caturbo, who's gonna give us a public land update, some of the things that he's been seeing out there, and then we're gonna join Aiden Epperson, who walks us through a story that came to fruition pretty fast on November 1st. Him and his brother Avery, along with Tyler Bellman, got access to a property somewhere there in the middle of October, speed scouted it, and Chasing November stayed true to its name, and these guys had an incredible hunt. So he's gonna walk us through the process, how they figured out the farm, some of the observations they made, and then ultimately a preview of the episode that will soon follow on the main show with the actual video footage. And then finally, we get an update on DK. If you've been following our social media, you know, Mike Reed was able to put that buck down. This cold front that we've been talking about paired with that late October, it just brought some of the best action in Midwest Whitetail history. And so we're gonna give you some sneak peeks at the footage of DK, what he looks like, and hope you guys enjoy it. Hope there's some great takeaways from it for you that you can apply to your own hunting. As I said, November 4th right now, so good luck if you're hunting today. Please let us know in the comments how your hunts are going, what you're seeing. And before we get into the podcast, I want to bring attention to our Chasing November giveaway. Super easy entry, as I talked about in the last one. All you gotta do is go visit Arctic Shield on Instagram, follow their link tree. There's a Chasing November section right there. Go ahead and click on that. Go ahead and follow and enter the information required. Follow the partners, and you're gonna be entered to win some great prizes. So. Appreciate you guys taking the time to watch. Without further ado, let's jump to the action and hope you guys enjoy. All right, guys, well, welcome back to the fifth episode of the After Hours Podcast. And we have got three awesome guests that are going to bring some good action your way. Josh Parks here, no updates, have not been hunting, but that is totally fine because Mr. Aiden Epperson, Northern Missouri, was able to put a buck down November 1st, Second, yeah. November 1st, that's a great story. Obviously, if you've been following social media, it's no secret that the legend of DK has come to a close on the river farm, and then Gavin has also been continuing his public land quest. So without further ado, I say we jump right into it. Gavin, how's the hunting been? Yeah, it's been definitely eventful. I mean, the public land is producing for sure. It's it's awesome to see a ton of deer on public in general and good caliber bucks at that. So, you know, there was a lot of corn around the public this year, way more than I had seen in, in previous years. And they're just now getting all of it out. And so in the past like week, I've had multiple different bucks showing up uh, that I'd never seen before. And um, it's been really cool to see lots of good action. We had a, a hunt near bedding area the other night. Saw certainly not anything big, but I think five different bucks and in, in, a, in a doe fawn or something like that. But I mean, super, super exciting to have those good, that good of hunts on, you know, public and everything. Are you seeing any sort of, uh, for lack of a better term, rutting activity, chasing, grunting? Um, definitely, uh, some running activity more so from the mature bucks. I mean, they're hitting scrapes hard. They're, they're rubbing. I mean, I've seen, seeing bucks rub and stuff. Um, the younger ones are just kind of cruising around. I mean, I got cameras kind of littered throughout these areas and you'll see one pop up on here and then he's on there mm -hmm. the 20 minutes later. I mean, they're just moving all over the place, but, uh, it seems like the bigger ones, there's a couple target bucks that I've had on there for a couple years. Um, and they're they're on does hard already i mean there's there's one that's i mean he's just disappeared now because he's probably with probably dog, locked down you know, so yeah um no that's it's amazing how many different deer gavin i mean like obviously you guys haven't been able to see this because you haven't got to see the trail cam photos but he's got more deer on his public land piece than like all of the quote unquote private land properties that i have all year long he's had more buck photos and so that <laughs> Is it to me that's you know obviously we've talked about Iowa public lands really awesome no doubt we have a great DNR great habitat structures you know just great management of the state's resource but it really shows kind of what you talked about on your blog series is like year number three on these pieces you're so much further ahead of the curve mm -hmm. and so I really am hoping that that uh, 
is the difference maker coming up for you. Yeah. Scouting is king. I mean, there's, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. I mean, it's, that's what it comes down to. And it's proved, I've proven it to myself in the past and it's continues to shine through, you know, so. Yep. And you can, you can go and I mean, you can attest this and I've experienced it. I mean, you might go walk 20 publics and find two that you're like, this is going to work. Exactly. Yeah. They're not all created equal as far as deer habitat and deer hunting, but you get the right stretch of habitat in the right area. uh, You know, then you just, you focus on those, you know? Yeah. The biggest thing I've found is those harder to access areas, whether they're separated by water, a lot of topography or things like that, like anywhere that's hard to access for people or just a long distance, obviously, you know, those seem to be money spots. You know, yeah, less people are willing to get right on it. Right if you guys go watch Gavin's blog, he will be sure to drop you a pin with GPS coordinates, and you can check out where he's hunting. And have it help me, yeah, Coming at you. <laughs> Speaking of River Bottom, Mr. Mike Reed, can we get a sneak peek before we dive into the story? Yeah, man. Let's see, I got to back up a little bit here. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness, man. There he is. Good night. All I can think about when I'm seeing that is the Kelsey encounter, Kelsey kill night. Mm-hmm. And when Deke I know me out literally. there and I'm like, I'm so glad we get to see what he looks like right now. I mean, I that was... he broke off uh, part of this brow and then part of that brow, but otherwise is intact. You know, last year he had broken off his brow and this G3 in September and uh, that gave him the pass. And um, he actually, you know, I think that his frame was a little bit bigger last year. Um, and this year he's got more mass, you know. But um, cool deer. I mean, it doesn't often happen that the first encounter. How we're going to work this one through, guys, we're going to try to keep it, quote, unquote, um, chronological. And the first encounter is actually going to be with Aiden. And so if you listen to episodes three and four, you know, we talked about this awesome cold front that was coming in the late October pairing with the pre-rut. Mike talked about a bunch of different tactics. Owen talked about a bunch of different tactics and, you know, Aiden, I think we can dive right into the story. You know, he was able to put a buck down on November 2nd, but really this story starts a few weeks before that. Uh, getting permission or excuse me, you know, just hunting access to a farm extremely late in the game. Correct. Like almost yeah. middle of October. Yeah. I think it was every even step foot there. Right. The first day we stepped foot on was the 15th, man. So <laughs> two yeah. weeks. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's that easy, late. huh? <laughs> yeah. A little late, a little intrusive, you know, but you got to come kill their buck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, let's uh, let's start there. October 15th, you know, obviously, if you want to give a little bit of background, you know, to, you know, who you and Avery are, where you guys come from, what got you into hunting, you know, I think that'd be really awesome. Obviously, you guys have had some really awesome encounters and kills over the years, going back to the drifter buck where he comes by in front of the combine, you rattle him up and decoy him, yep. 305 on your guys' first farm that you'd ever purchased, you know, you've, you've had a lot of special memories this is just the next one. So yeah, floor is all yours, brother. Let us know. Yeah. So, uh, we first came on the Midwest whitetail, I guess it'd been the spring of 2021. Um, and that was the year that we were able to harvest drifter and 305, but we started hunting way back at a young age. I think sometime a few years before we got on Midwest whitetail, we picked up a camera and said, you know, we're going to do this film and hunt thing. And, uh, this is where we're at now. So, uh, probably six years later, something like that. So, um, that's pretty cool, uh, ride and aspect to add to the, the hunting that we like to do. So, uh, but no, uh, the 15th of October, um, Tyler, Avery and I were able to get this piece of ground to hunt. It's 260 acres made up of Creek draws, CRP. And, uh, October 15th in Missouri was a day that you probably should have been hunting that evening. Um, it was perfect conditions, but we went in, I did kind of did some speed scouting. I was the first one to get there. I took the side by side around and just trying to find scrapes, use the Onyx app, trying to find scrapes so we could deploy the Cuddy link system when they got there. Um, by the time we got it all said and done, I had pretty much everything marked. And, um, while I was doing that, I actually found the tree that we end up 
killing stick tight out of. I had found that tree and it looked like in years past it had already had some sort of shooting lanes cut out of it. So I was like, you know what? That might not be a bad spot to start. So <laughs> I marked that one, saved that for memory bank later. Um, and I think we were in there till dark that night deploying the cutting link system. I think we set up nine cameras, which you think you cover a property that size pretty good. You don't. You mess up all kinds of things. We soon realized that after we started hunting that, you know, we're missing a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but soon, right after that, uh, I think it was the 17th, we decided to try to carve out a couple green plots um, just in spots that funneled good, um, you know, that seemed like it might have been close to the bedding. Um, while I was driving around, I kind of jumped up some deer here and there. I was like, okay, well, we'll let's try this for the first year. We were able to put weed in. Um, it's getting a little late for that, especially when it turned cold, but they started popping up. So, okay. You know, it's, I think it's going to turn out all right. But um, then I think a few days after that, we had a uh, stick tight show up and another deer we called 210. Um, and stick tight, we had him a couple times. 210 was consistent. Stick tight disappeared for about a week. <laughs> and it was like, okay, he was definitely going to be our primary shooter on the farm. Um, and so we kind of put him in the back burner because we had one picture, I think, of him in that first week. And then it was... Uh, in third week of October, right? Yeah, this would have been 18th, somewhere like that, I think was the first picture we had. Maybe the 19th, I think, was the last picture. And uh, kind of the back burner, me and Avery were thumbing through, trying to figure out what deer we were going to go after. We were kind of tied up with work, so we weren't hunting a lot anyway. Um we decided to go make a set in that food plot where I uh, had found that tree that had already kind of had the shooting lanes cut out of. We went ahead and hung a double there. Um, it, it set well for a south wind, which we were having several of those, and it was just a good observation set. You could see that whole CRP bottom. Um, so it was like, well, nonetheless, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. And sure enough, deer activity was thick and heavy in there and cameras weren't picking up most of it um i think the first set we had was the 25th um it was part of the first day i think of that cold front we had in october and then we went back in the second day and uh the 26th and that was the day that we'd seen him we had a picture of that stick type buck um in the center part of the farm at daylight about 8 30 and we knew he had to be close. It was kind of a toss up. Like, did he go to the South park? Did he, you know, double back and stay out in that big CRP bottom that uh, we had been hunting over. So our gut or what we was like, we'll go to the South park. There's a timber stand there. And from previous people hunting there before and knowing that area, they're like, Hey, this is usually a pretty good funnel. We got in there to hang a stand. Miraculously, there wasn't a tree to hang in. <laughs> that was going to be very easy. Wind was swirling. And luckily, we were early enough that we were like, let's just back out. Let's go to the stand we already have hung. Um, that was kind of where my gut was telling me to go anyway. And sure enough, we encountered him. That That's the the first encounter of stick tight. Um, so I'm playing it right now. If y'all are listening on the audio side, one of the things they're able to do here on the video podcast on YouTube is play some of the clips. So... Um, Right now we're showing stick tight and he's really nice. Yeah. Beautiful. Man. Yeah. The pictures did not do him justice. Uh, that, that deer, when you seen him the first time we rattled and Avery's like, he just stood up. He was about 500 yards away and you could just tell <laughs> he's got a frame on him. You know, he's, he's so tall. Yeah. A frame. Yeah. I actually said those exact words tonight. I encountered a buck and I was like, man, the pictures do not do that. Deer justice. No. <laughs> so. Yeah. I like when that happens. <laughs> yeah, that was definitely, he, he turned and came right into us. I was like, we thought it was going to happen. He ended up closing the gap to like 150 yards. I'm convinced that if we had had a decoy setting out that night, we'd have probably killed him because by the time he made his way there, he kind of lost interest and uh, tried throwing a few more grunts, snort wheeze at him. He'd lost interest and was doing his thing. He went and worked the scrape and kind of veered off and, Last time we'd seen him, um, 
but from then on, he was just consistent on cameras. That a lot of daylight activity. Um, you could tell he was kind of running the show there that last week, October in there. And we knew it was just a matter of time. We had a bunch of Northwest winds come through then. It just didn't work well for that spot. We tried hunting down um, in the center part, but we were giving up too much for very little. Um, trying to hunt that Northwest wind. And it, you could just tell that when we were hunting, well, I think we hunted it twice on a Northwest wind and the activity was way down compared to what we had been seeing hunting a more safe wind. So we elected to back out. We kind of shifted gears. Um, Avery was hunting a buck, uh, the G3 buck here on the home farm, and he was kind of being daylight active. Um, so we were here hunting and I think it was, yeah, it was the November 1st. Um, we got back from work, kind of ironic. I owe grandpa a big thank you. Um, <laughs> we had gotten home. We was getting ready to go climb in the blind for the G3 buck because he had just daylighted the night before. And trail camera picture notification pops up. Grandpa's driving the tractor through the whole core of the home farm, just out looking around. Avery called him and said, <laughs> hey, what are you doing? He's like, oh, just checking things out. He's like, hmm. He's like, you know, we had a big deer in there. He was just in there yesterday. He's like, so I should probably get out of here. Yeah, you probably should get out of there. So, uh, which it's a piece of equipment. You know, they're kind of used to that. But we were yeah. sitting up here in the house, and you could see him driving the tractor back through the draw. And uh, we're like, you know what? Let's just. You could probably go in there. Probably didn't bother him a whole lot. But you know, let's just. The wind's right for stick tight for the first time. It was the first south after a bunch of norse. Um, so we're like. Let's go, let's go hunt there. And sure enough, an hour being in the stand, <laughs> he pops out. So well, uh, let's take a step back. Cause there's a little bit more to, yeah. he doesn't just step out. No, he doesn't. <laughs> so you'll, uh, we had gotten in the stand. I think we were in the stand 30 minutes. As soon as we got in there, deer were milling around and you could tell that day it was like November 1st, a light switch flipped off. Cameras were just going nuts that day. I mean, the whole day we were getting notifications. I don't think there was one uh, report that it just, we didn't have pictures. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we knew, we knew we were in for a, a good set. I didn't know if there was a hot doe in there, but it was just activity was crazy. And uh, we were sitting there and I looked down, I was scouring through the binos, uh, through the CRP, and I kind of had some branches in front of me. And I could see a buck on the edge of the CRP and he was kind of facing quarter and away. And all I could see was that G2. And I was like, oh, it's him. I just gut feeling, you know, I was thinking, oh, it's him. It's him. I told Avery and he got on the camera and I grabbed the grunt call and I threw out some grunts. And I had to sit down in the stand to be able to see. And Avery's like, man, he turned. Avery's like, man, I don't think that's him. And I, you'll see you see the buck I'm talking about, you're like, no, that's definitely not him. He was a little <laughs> dink, but uh, I had <laughs> seen him and through the binos, I was like, yeah, definitely not. And I turned to look at Avery and I'd plop my binos in there. I wasn't being cautious about anything. I just plopped had my binos in. Had you called that deer right? Huh? Had you called it that deer? The one yeah, that was a deer. I had grunted twice at that deer thinking it was stick tight before I had confirmed that it wasn't. Yeah. And I, I mean, 30 seconds had gone by from the time I'd grunted to the time I'd plop my binos in, turned to my left to talk to Avery, and he's standing at 35 yards staring at us. And I looked at Avery, I just said, that's him. <laughs> Avery's, Avery's locked on the camera here. I said, don't move. And to, come to find out, I just felt like he was staring through our soul, but he was so co concentrated on finding that grunt. He was looking past us, and we were kind of in the shadows anyway, so it set up good. Um but I was, I was caught with my hands tied. We didn't, I thought I'd turned one of the second angles on when I had, before I grunted, but I guess I didn't get the record clicked on. Um, and Avery was trying to turn. You see him, he's just froze out this way with the camera. And you see, he just slowly kind of turns this way. And uh, he, he kind of gets shaky because he's trying to reach up to turn the GoPro on while the deer, while he's, just glued on us he finally got the second angle turned on and i'm set down got my binos hanging out and i'm here with my hand trying to reach up to grab my bow off the hanger 
and it felt like an eternity. I mean, it was probably two, three minutes, but felt like an hour going by. <laughs> <laughs> and he finally turned. And when he turned to start walking, I was like, okay, he's, he's not locked on us. He's just trying to find this grunt and maybe get away with just a little bit more. So I was finally able to get my hand on the bow and then he turned and locked. Another couple minutes go by. He turned to walk again. I got my bow off, got my range. I get hooked up. I draw. And as soon as I draw, he turns and faces directly at me. And he, that, I think it, we looked on the GoPro, you can see it. It was dead on two minutes. I was at full draw waiting on this gear to turn. And but luckily I was sitting down, but I, I was able to rest the cam on my knee and kind of drop my elbow and kind of rest it on my bino deal to kind of, and that wall on that point so good that, I could, mm. you know, it wasn't so bad being able to rest it on there. And then finally <laughs> turned 25 yards and, uh, the rest is history. He uh, took out across the CRP and ended up bedding down. So, man, man, that's awesome. Well, be careful November first blowing on that grunt tube. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> I'd almost took the decoy in that day. Oh, oh dang. <laughs> yeah, I'd almost took the decoy in that day and set it up in that food plot. I'm kind of glad I didn't because I don't know how close he was bedded or if he was bedded, but. He, he was close when he we got it. Yeah. I mean, he was within 100 yards, 50 yards, and I'm glad we just elected to kind of slip up. In, and if we he did have the decoy, I think he was in the right mood that that decoy might not have been there when I turned to the left. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, it was, uh, it was nuts. It was crazy. Man, that's exciting. A couple of things that pop into my head for questions is, so you talked about, you know, your first haunt, south winds, identify that that – produced some really good movement yeah. northwest wind didn't and do you attribute that to maybe that you guys were quote unquote blowing stuff out with the stand you were sitting in or do you think that it had something to do with on the northwest wind maybe it wasn't so advantageous for those deer to bed on your property so close because that was one thing that a couple podcasts ago mike and i talked about was just like how change and variation mm -hmm. you know, a bunch of souths you get north all of a sudden things light up well you know you would expect to have a great hunt oh yeah on those days yeah i'm just curious what your thoughts are obviously you've only been there for two weeks or whatever but yeah i like think it was the sixth hunt was when we killed so we did we and we only hunted that one field we didn't we haven't even touched a you know two-thirds of the property but <laughs> from when i had that uh, it's awesome when I had kind of done my scouting, I noticed there were several beds in this core area, kind of where I thought stick tight could be bedding at some point in time. Um, and for that spot, that bedding there, northwest wind was okay. You could slip in. There's just not a lot of trees. It's tree lines. We didn't we hadn't pulled a redneck in anywhere yet, um, especially with those deer in there. We didn't want to kind of make them, you know, leery bam, there's something new that hadn't been there for the last, you know, however many years. And uh, we didn't really have time for that either. So um, we slipped a stand in. And I think, I think it has to, a lot to do with that spot there being very good for a south wind, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense because you would think, especially the way they were moving through there, that they'd want the wind in their nose. And it never, with a south wind, that's not really the case. But I, maybe it's, you know, you can see what's in front of you, smell what's behind you towards the creek and the draw um, where the wind's swirling. I don't know, but I know with that northwest wind, we were cutting off a very good chunk of where I know some deer were coming from. Um, and maybe when we were hunting that south wind spot up on the other side, um, you know, part of that's cut off. And where we were seeing deer, maybe they were coming from that that spot down to the north or the i guess be the southeast and by the time we were seeing them we thought they were coming from that bedding i don't know um that's one way it could have been going down but we were just giving up a lot of bedding and i know where some deer were coming through because on those south winds we'd have we had a camera right below the that northwest winds uh, uh stand we had and we'd have deer daylight through there when we were there obviously they weren't doing that um but it, theoretically, it should have worked perfect for 
stick tight. If he was bedded in that, he would have been out in front of us. But I don't know. It's just one thing we'll have to kind of learn. And I don't know that that spot's going to be a great. It was okay to get down there and close, but I don't know about that time of year. Maybe in the rut, maybe a morning spot when your thermals are rising. But yeah, I just I think it's an interesting thing to think about because I mean. If you think Northwest winds, the only time you're ever going to have a good hunt and a cold front, I mean, this, yeah. this, uh, sequence of events would, you know, probably yeah. lead to like, don't overlook any day that you have the chance to hunt. Oh yeah. But that you can see a long ways. And yeah. so you're getting to observe quite a bit. And, um, I appreciate you sharing the story with us, man. I'm really excited yeah. to bring the episode to, to life. And I think that we're going to end up pairing that with Zach Rosman um, one, super cool thing that I feel is important that viewers or listeners get to know about you and your brother. You guys bust your tail. Not only have you, because how old are you? 24. This how old is 24? I had to think about that. How old is, <laughs> uh, he's 21. It doesn't get any better, buddy. So <laughs> 24 years old, 21 years old, you guys purchased a farm together. And I mean, that would mean that your brother was in his teens and you were in your he was 19 and I was 21. Exactly. I mean, like there's, there's so much to be celebrated about that, man. And I think that's the coolest thing in the world. And so here you go. You've got the home farm. You've got a place you put your own sweat and equity and put the money up for. But it's, you know, a similar thing to like, I'd say Zach is like, it's not that you don't have enough to hunt but you love it so much that you're going to go out of your way to figure out the next permission farm, yeah. the next, whatever it is. And, you know, for it to come together on this place in three weeks or two weeks or whatever it is, yeah. it's just a testament to like hard work pays off. You know what yeah. I mean? I am uh, really excited for folks to get to see it. I'm excited to see it. I haven't actually got to see the kill day. So yeah, I'm a, yeah, I'm excited to, get it all put together so and see that we'll see what the story looks like and <laughs> all put together and everything i think it's going to be something pretty special so yeah the well, six day I, challenge yeah <laughs> that ain't no kidding <laughs> <laughs> yeah. hey, they don't always happen like that we've done a lot of hunting with uh maybe never <laughs> yeah i think last I, well I, last year i went and hunted a lot of days and never did kill so yeah Yep. I think I think it's that can be a competition on the show here. We can just all right, whoever can get a new property and kill in six hunts or less. Yep. <laughs> just thrown, just thrown eight. Okay. Yep. Let's see it. It's fantastic, man. I love it. Yeah. It well, feels good when it does work out. Oh man, that's yeah. Because <laughs> because the ninety nine percent of the time it does it. Yeah, but it's interesting to to notice a tree too, though that you say, you know, somebody hunted there once upon a time. Yeah, that that's like those old wooden stands. You know, you're like, this is probably a good spot. Yeah, you could see there was a great big branch cut off. You know, fresh cut laying on the ground. I was like, you know, it's already got shooting lanes. That's a lot less work we have to deal with later on. I'm like, well, it's worth a shot. You know, yeah, it's worth a shot. That's right. Yeah. Well, congratulations again, man. Thanks. Thank you. you were one of, it's so funny like we were talking about it amongst ourselves but that front and going into the first few days of november we're obviously only into november 3rd right now but it seemed like every time i got to service it was a new hey dude buck down hey dude yeah. buck down and so you were on the back end of that but i mean dude it's at yeah. i don't know 11 or 12 team members that have put deer on the ground and you know that takes us back a little bit in time yeah dk dk <laughs> it did not take just one hunt <laughs> but it yeah. one it's a, interesting it's it's always fun to follow a deer for us you know and uh for so long i mean we got i'd have to look back and see you know we probably even go farther back but when he was a three-year-old is when we really started started saying hey that deer's got some potential and uh, one of the encounters that jumps out in my mind is actually when Grant shot Bob, you mm -hmm. know, he came out first and they were even talking about shooting him. He's like, is he three or four? And the, mm -hmm. he was always kind of a bigger body deer. And he was like a, I don't know, 135 inch, 140 inch eight point. Yep. And, uh, you know, Grant, Grant was like, he's too young. He's too young. And it was, that was kind of neat for me to watch Grant be like, no, I'm not shooting that deer. But, uh, and then, 
the next year as a four-year-old we had quite a few encounters with him he grew little tiny g4s and then um you know last year so when he was a four-year-old we said well he could be five we we're never really sure last year i was like well he's certainly a five-year-old and he's on the hit list he showed up in the summer big old velvet frame i was like god look at that thing split g2 and in september broke those tines off and I, I mean, I talked to a few of you guys about like, maybe I should still hunt him, you know, I don't know. I don't know if he's going to make it. And, uh, you know, he's such a big typical uh, frame and, you know, I got a good tax trimmer. So, you know, it's kind of going through that thing. And then, <laughs> but I was like, no, 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 no. Let's just see what he does. And, um, he, you know, he's, he's one of those deer that he doesn't really live on the farm. You know, he's, he visits the farm. And when he was younger, he seemed to be on there a little more. But uh, these last couple of years, he's definitely off the farm the majority of the time. And he'd come visit the farm. And, you know, you get pictures of him, not infrequently, but it wasn't like some of the other bucks. Whereas every day, it was like, you know, it was every three or four days or whatever. And you might have an encounter or two, but it's not like we saw him. Like, I'm seeing that moss deer right now. I'm like, moss is in there. I mean, we see him every hunt almost. And... Um, you know, last year we were hunting Kelsey. I mean, I, I didn't have a buck I wanted to hunt on the home farm, and we were in there a ton. And we ended up seeing him off in the distance twice, which once November rolls around, you can you can generally see a lot of the river farm based on where you're sitting, um, but nothing up close and personal. And then we had that encounter, and Gavin was filming me when I was hunting Kelsey late season. It was like, all right, finally some good, good footage of him right there. And uh, actually it kind of reaffirmed, I was like, I'm, I'm glad I didn't like – want to hunt him or anything i saw him i was like you know what i can't wait to see him next year and he popped up this summer with just looking great enough mass i thought maybe he won't break in september this time because the year before he busted his beam off and uh when i shot marino i mean he was out there in the plot that night and we, we got some good footage of him and um i actually have the busted beam four-year-old shed off of him and uh anyway really really sort of was he was my focus this year and I, I was ready for the long haul i mean i was like all right this is gonna be a deer where we have to we're gonna have to hunt him all year put our time in be patient sit in the right spots and hopefully we cross paths and uh you know we had that beautiful front i was like this is a great opportunity and so we were sitting sitting in there sitting there sitting there and there was a little period obviously with ehd I'm just, I'm nervous. He disappeared because he got in there and like we'd get a picture, maybe one picture a night on one camera. And so, all right, he's coming in and he's taking a little dip through the farm and, and going and leaving. And uh, then he, he went quiet for a bit of time. And I was like, man, did he die? You know, Caleb's finding all these dead deer and we found some dead deer. And then my neighbor found this, this, this pincher buck that he actually texted me earlier today. He's 182. I mean, it's a big, big, giant, massive deer. I mean, a six-year-old buck, another one four years of history with. And one that I was either me or the neighbor, I was hoping we could hunt him this year. And I'm like, man, that would be just so tragic if if all of these bucks are just dying of EHD. Anyway, and, and Ryan and I, are, we get one picture at midnight one night. I'm like, all right, he's still alive. You know, and so the front, I'm like, let's get in there. Let's, let's, let's hunt him. Re rekindled the uh, excitement for it. Is this the front? Sorry to interrupt you. Are we at the middle of October front? No, we're we're like this last little good cold front. I mean, it's it's um so we just dove in there. I mean, I've been I had made a few sits for the um in the pinch, you know, the week before when we had some good weather, but we were trying to hunt them on food before the we were getting to the pre-rut stage. You know, I was just going there in the afternoons. So I wasn't really hunting mornings, trying to hunt them on food. And early October to, no early september we had him on one food plot a lot and then he kind of disappeared but i was like well you know this time of year in mid-october i'm more likely to catch him come to these these food sources but this this cold front that um we're just talking about october 28th 27 28 29 um which it hit owen you know owen's three hours west of us so it hit owen a little bit before us and he had a killer hunt and then everyone was texting kind of saying like man i'm so dead tonight and that wind we had a 40 mile hour wind and i wasn't having bad hunts but it wasn't like i mean it wasn't crazy where you think man this awesome weather and this awesome front october whatever it was um we had a couple great morning sits in the pinch saw some four-year-olds three-year-olds chasing young bucks chasing like good activity um but just 
no DK, which is which is what I wasn't expecting him to just roll in the first cold front, obviously. But uh, we roll up to October 30th, and I think with the real feels about 16 degrees, and it was that it was a cool, it was a calm day, it was clear, high pressure. You know, you just it felt really good. And the morning before actually felt really good too. We ended up seeing 30 deer, I think, but it was all young young bucks and and does and i was like i cannot believe there's not one wrecked buck coming through the pinch because we had sat so many times right there and seen in in worse conditions i would say and had you know good encounters gavin when you film me i mean big the big three-year-old big four-year-old mm-hmm. you know and we're they're grunting and eating acorns and the, the pinch is great any year but this year with the acorns on the ground it is it is really good and so there it is you know you got the the river on the right hand side of the screen and and that little native patch there's a slough just inside the the timber there and my stand is just inside the slough and um you got that grass on the river and they really pinch down right there but all those green leaves you see on this on the screen those dark green that's all red oaks Mm -hmm. and uh there's a lot of acorns this year. I mean, it's it's just been unbelievable. The deer come in there in the morning and they just feed and feed and feed and feed. And bucks come and chase the does around. They they'll run out of there and then they end up they come right back in. They're feeding. They're feeding. I mean, it's they just want to be right there, which is I, I've never seen that in six years on the property. Um, and so anyway, we had a great first two hours. You know, sun comes up at legal shootings at seven. And we had a young nine chasing deer around. And then I could see moss. We didn't get any footage of him. He's off in the wetland, just dog and a doe. And I'm like, man, it's, 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 we're one day in further into it, you know, and, and here it is. I mean, they were just running all around and grunting and chasing and young bucks. And, and, uh, it was, the activity was dying down close to nine, which it had been most days that last week of October where, they're all sort of meeting there in the pinch, but then they work off the bed and then they got kind of, it would get kind of quiet. And so nine o'clock rolled around and I was telling Ryan, I said, we should probably do an update. It's been a couple hours, do a little update interview. And he says, I see a deer. I see a deer about 85 yards off. I'm like, okay. And so yeah, I look up and there's a, along the river, it's kind of thick where I, I don't have a great, uh picture when i look that way i can't see what's coming there's one stretch and they they often walk up there and then they're sort of on you when you can see them and so i i pick up this doe and the doe is looking across the pinch away from the river at the field edge and a lot of times there's a mowed lane there and the bucks are working scrapes and so i'm my attention turns over there and i'm looking i'm like maybe he's over there what bucks over there that she's looking at and uh, I've got, it's cold, you know, I've got my, my beanie on, I've got my hood on, and I, I'm glassing. And uh, so my left peripheral vision is, is gone. And I'm looking over there, I don't see anything. I, I kind of sit back, and out of the corner of my eye, I mean, DK's at 32 yards. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah, he scares me, you know. And uh, I look at Rye, I'm like, right, DK's right here. Rye's filming him. Rye's just like, he's on him, he's filming him. He's just <laughs> like, whoa, you know. He's just... <laughs> Afterwards, we laughed about it because he's like, I don't think I ever even tried to say something to you. He's like, I thought I did, but I don't think I actually did. <laughs> and, and he thought I was sitting still, like, looking at him, but I was so fixed over here. And, you know, it's interesting, it's late in the morning, that doe is right there. There's another little buck behind the doe that I'd seen. I just never saw him slip up the trail. And he's just eating acorns. He's not doing anything. He's eating acorns right here. And then he he walks in. He's just feeding. And uh, oh my gosh. Look at the body on him, man. The neck, the face. He's got saggy eyes. That's just Iowa. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he's always had a big body. You know, I, I, I shared that picture with you uh Josh, I think it was at the summer meeting in June Mm -hmm. of him actually right here on this camera. And, um, you know, I'm like, that's gotta be him. I mean, he had bases and brows and his body was just so massive. I was like, that's gotta be DK. Mm -hmm. And, uh, anyway, he walked in and I I was so bundled up. I told her, I said, if we see him, hopefully we see him a little ways off because I got to like take half my clothes off to shoot. So because I was, I was like, there's no way I can shoot. I had my thick gloves on and 
17 layers over my neck, my anchor point. So I stand up and take my gloves off and take my hood off and pull my neck gaiter down and you know, <laughs> uh, get my bow. And he's facing us. And I think I ranged him like, it'll be funny to watch in the GoPro because I think I ranged him like six times. I'm like, okay, 32, 32, 32, take it down. 32, I think, where is he? Is he going to go right or is he going to go left? And he actually walks just perfect, just what you want him to do, right, right in front of us through this nice big gap. I'm at full draw. It's 25 yards. And I'm like, let out a big bleed at him. He doesn't stop. He just keeps walking right through. And he gets in this other clump of trees and then goes uh, where I have a good shot at him, but I know Rye has trouble seeing him from there, just where he's he's kind of behind. We're in this double cottonwood. And so I'm at full draw, and I'm just waiting, and I hear Rye say, no, 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 and I'm, I'm okay. You know, and he stops. He's just eating an acorn, you know, and he's standing there broadside at now 22 yards. And so I'm, I'm at full draw, and I look back at Rye, and, his, and he's got the camera arm all the way extended out, He's like, okay, okay. And so, you know, go down and just, I mean, it hit the mark, you yeah. know, and then of course he wheels around and I can immediately see blood coming out of his mouth and felt confident in the shot he's doing the death run. I mean, it's just as hard as he can go. And like, well, he, he runs like he's going to run back where he came from, but then he loops around and goes on the river's edge. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm looking at him in the binos because actually Dak, when I shot Dak out of that stand, he did the exact same thing. He took off to the north and he loops through that grass patch. And I'm like, man, he's going to go in the river. And I have nightmares because of Prodigy in the river. And, um, and I'm watching him like, I think he's going to just jump in the river. I'm like, oh my, he's on the edge. He's on the edge. He's on the edge. And then there's a bunch of, there's a cluster of like all these little trees and we lose him. And I literally turned to Ryan and said, I didn't hear a splash because, because I was like, did he just like go off the edge? And uh, anyway, of course, we, we talk about everything. We, we look back at the shot. I'm like, look, before I get too excited, I want to get down and see blood. And uh, I have all this, this confidence from the initial, my, what I saw with my naked eye. But so we gave him a little bit of time, climb down and look. I mean, there's, it's a great blood trail. And so I'm like, all right, all right. What I thought happened did happen. So we start following the trail and um, we get to the river and I take a peek. I'm like, let me just, let me just glass the river. Let me just glass, make sure he's not in there you know? <laughs> right away. Two seconds. He's just stuck on a log, like a hundred yards down the river. And uh, we follow the blood trail, right? He stopped just on the bank. And of course it's a drought year. The river's really, really low. Most of the river. And he was just on the cliff and it's about 16 feet down to the water. And you can just see where he tumbled just over head over heels down the bank. That's actually my arrow broke when he fell. My arrow was on the water's edge and uh, the rest of it was in him. And uh, you know, the vast majority of the river, it's a sandy bottom river is ankle deep, but this is an inside curve. And it's probably five feet deep that whole way. And so there's a little current and he floated down and got caught. And, you know, we had a lot of fun getting him out. You know, I tried to get in the canoe right here, but because it's ankle deep, I bottomed out. You know, some weight, I guess. But uh, eventually got to the deeper part and were able to get up to him. I, I actually tried from the bank. From the bank, I could see the bottom. The water was really, really clear. And so I actually went home and got some chest waders. And I thought, maybe I can maybe I can crawl out to him with the chest waders. But it was just a little too deep for my waders. And so, yeah, we, we dumped the canoe in there and drug it over to the deeper part. And uh, I just hooked the rope to him and we hauled him out of there. But mm -hmm. wasn't quite as – there's no way I was get swimming. You know, I made the joke on the Instagram post, but um, for everyone out there listening, that was one of the stupid things I've done in my life, swim a river in 40 degree water. So you know, it, it, was, it all worked out, but uh, I would not recommend. So uh, we were, and I actually still got wet. You know, I got in the water thinking I had good waders, but uh, I got about waist deep and I was like, not good waders, not good waders. <laughs> so, it was uh i guess i don't duck cut enough but um anyway it was great ryan gavin were there we uh we had to work to get him up that that big bank 
but um you know it just doesn't happen like that very often you know i really had my mind on the long haul for this deer and then the right weather pattern the right time of year he's not off locked down or chasing you know just the right situation and he just strolled on in and i mean wouldn't you love a 22 yard shot on every buck you ever shot at you know yeah. relaxed so it was uh it's beautiful i mean i super happy with him and uh great deer my biggest typical and um it's just pretty cool to you know have that much history with the deer and be able to get him on the ground well we'll have to if you guys are listening go over to the youtube video and drop in the comments a score make a guess i haven't heard it oh, mike don't say it make your guess whoever gets the closest or if you get it spot on we will get in contact with you and try to get you set up with some chasing november apparel I think that'd be a fun little contest to do. But yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple of things that jump into my mind. Um, you know, obviously, you made a comment about 2022 that the, you know DK was not on the farm very often. Do you think that the number of bucks that between yourself, Bella, Mike, or excuse me, Rye and Abby? Because how many bucks did you take off the river farm in 22? Yeah, it actually was six. Um, you know, I shot Poseidon October 6th and then hunted Kelsey all year. And those were the two that I wanted to chase. Um, you know, I, when the end of September was rolling around and I was like, okay, which bucks am I going to chase? And I was, I was really focused on Kelsey. Poseidon, I was, he had just showed back up. I was trying to kind of figure out what he was. And he strolled in the first sit and I was like, yep, <laughs> you know, and shot him. And I was like, that doesn't happen very often either. But, uh, Pretty cool. I just uh, that worked out, and then obviously Abby took Rob. That was a deer that had was at least a six year old and big bully buck that was all over that area. And uh, you know, rack size doesn't matter a lot of times. Uh, in fact, last year we asked ourselves a lot who broke him. Yeah, you know, in September. But um, you know, that time of year Kelsey was actually on that end of the farm, and Kelsey was very dominant all over the farm um he has a year age on dk and you know rob had a year age on dk the buck that uh rye shot wasn't really on that end of the farm but another mature buck that was kind of on the south end uh that he was able to take when i was hunting kelsey and then bella's buck another one not as probably as important of a player one that always showed up late season on food it wasn't one that we ever got in october november or december really it was, it was always late he'd always showed up that post rut you know so probably not another big factor but you look at taking out kelsey and rob as two very dominant six and a half year old bucks on that end of the farm it's hard to imagine it not making a difference yeah right i mean you you just have a void there and um you know and it's not like he's in the farm a ton this year i mean we didn't get far enough into the year i i do think there were two times this year that i had pictures of him pretty far to the south you know uh, around farther south than where i had filmed them late season that one year when i killed marina which is already almost let's see it's almost half a mile I mean, it's, it's, it's a good, it's a good chunk. It's 800 yards, you know, something like that. And it's almost half a mile. Um, you know, and granted this year is a little interesting because there's so much standing corn and they literally got it out. I kept telling Riley, like, we might not be able to really get on him until the corn comes out. And I mean, they were taking the corn out the day we killed him. They were in the combine an hour later. And I said, well, turns out we didn't need the corn to come out, you know, but, uh, it is interesting to see how the farm has changed because now all the corn is out as of today, officially. And I mean, the deer just really moving to the farm. I mean, it's, it's 300 acres of corn around there and all of a sudden all that cover has gone. And so, and the whole wetland is grass. I mean, it's all willow thickets and grass. I mean, it's all cover. So a lot, a lot of deer move in there. Um, but it, yeah, like it's hard to imagine yeah. You know, that didn't make a difference being more inviting, having less bucks, fighting him, pushing him out. I mean, I'd, I'd like to think that he was the most dominant one in there. Yeah. Well, I guess to end the DK story on this podcast, you guys can uh, expect to see that. So right now, tentatively, the schedule we're going to come out with Monday, we're going to feature Owens wide eight kill. 
what else is going on that the um story for lucky yeah potentially we're going to try to fit in an update with caleb griner he, he joined us on the podcast i want to say it was episode two or three and he had found that deer that he was calling og which for those who follow his blog was an absolute giant in his own right well the lucky deer that is just kind of once in a lifetime uh caleb was actually able to find him too and so his bad luck streak of EHD, you know, pretty much wiped out almost every deer that he was hunting. Mm -hmm. And we'll definitely try to get him on the next podcast to bring everybody up to speed. But Monday, expect that show. I think Thursday or Friday, we're going to try to put together uh, Mr. Aiden's kill here, paired with Zach Rosmus, who shot a buck in Iowa. And then the following Monday, we're going to have the DK saga. So trying to bring them to you guys as timely as possible and you know hopefully in those episodes not only entertainment but there's hopefully going to come through a lot of different lessons that you know you can still apply right now where it's really early in the month of november got a lot of great hunting ahead of us mike that brings us to current day you yeah. have a couple days off after shooting dk but vacation rolls on and you've had some great hunts yeah it's been i mean we're having a good time you know, with, with my job, I take my vacation, I got to plan it out. So it's, uh, I pick them months ago and it's like, it is what it is, whatever the weather is. And I try to take two or three days off each week so that I hopefully hit a good, a good stretch of, of hunting. But October 31st with the kids, we go, we go, um, <laughs> trick or treating. That was the last podcast. So I had my little pack of wolves and we were out there in the cold weather and we were trick or treating. It was a good time. But I, I worked all day, October 31st, November 1st. Uh, Aiden, you were saying, I mean, that first south after that string of norths, I mean, it was, yep. I was in clinic that day, and I was just like, look at the activity. I mean, it was one of those days where I was like, ah, I wish I was in a tree. <laughs> you know, it, was just, it was so good. But a uh, couple of my, you know, I love the last bit of October, but man, November 2nd and 3rd, first, second, and third, year after year, if I just look at trail camera photos, it is amazing the number of deer, um, big bucks on scrapes. You know, st you're still just not quite in that lockdown. And I, I feel like it it combines with that October 28th to November 3rd is probably really the, the best stretch. We say last week's of October, but I, I just love that period. Anyway, so tons of activity on the cameras November 1st. And then um, I was back at it yesterday. Now, yesterday um we tried out a, a different property and had a slow morning hunt you know i was being kind of conservative i'm i'm trying to figure out what deer i really wanted to hunt that buck rocky on my little 20 acre piece i haven't had a picture of him since october 22nd it is one that i'm i don't know could it be ehd deer is he is he alive and well i'd love to get one picture of him to know he's alive and then i would commit some time to him but we have this buck we're calling fitz magic um Ryan named him this past summer, but uh, a little bit of funny story behind that. But it's a lot of history with that deer as well. There's from we got pictures of him at three, four, five, six. I think he's a seven year old, you know, and it's he's always been a smaller body deer. And we we, we referred to him in the past as turn in 10, but um, we had tons of encounters with him the last two years. And he's always just been a solid deer. And every year, I think there was probably three years in a row where we're like, I kind of looks like a four-year-old, you know, he's, always, he's just always had this smaller, and like, well, maybe last year was a three-year-old, and uh, man, he didn't do much, well, let's see what he does next year, and uh, last year, I finally was like, I think he's been a four-year-old for three years now, so we, we might need to, we, we might need to go and like, look at trail camera pictures and try to figure out, because I'm like, is this one that we should get Bell on, or whatever, and I kept, he's always had these like little G5s, and uh, anyway, this year, I actually filmed him in velvet and, uh, I mean, he just, he's a beautiful buck and so, you know, we really should hunt that deer. And so we decided to get going after him today and, uh, went back on the river farm, that little peninsula where I hunted Kelsey so much last year. Cause I thought, you know, looking at where he'd been the last couple of weeks, um, that that's probably where he was betting. And, uh, unfortunately this morning the wind was not really cooperating i mean we had we were project projected to have a south southwest and it was blowing east you know and then we got some northly kicks and you know that it's trying to switch out of the north for for tonight and so it was kind of all over the place and 
this morning we're in there and we had a, a young buck come in and get our wind and it, it was he was confused i mean it, but he got out of there then i'm just looking at the wind testing the wind i'm like we need to get out of here and before we can actually get out of there another young buck came in and spooked and then i look out in the wetland and see a good buck trotting away with him and i put him in the binos and it's 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 this buck we call him fist magic and so i'm like well we saw him we didn't get any footage of him and so we got out of there early went to do some work and um i said tonight let's let's make a shift get on a food plot where we're kind of where he ran and where's a bunch of does and i thought this afternoon would be a good spot i got my spot picked out for the morning but tonight we climb in got three hours to go and we're not even set up i mean i looked down in the timber in front of us i can see a doe little spike chases a doe by another little buck comes out running chasing there's two other little bucks sparring over here and i look in the timber and i can i can see a, a big body buck walking with my naked eye i pick up my binos and i'm like there he is and it's it's four o'clock you know mm -hmm. and he comes out and there's a little opening between a couple big maples and there's a there's two does that were kind of trotting in front of him so i'm like all right he's on that doe and i have a spike in the food plot that i'm on and this is he's probably 150 yards off and so i i grunt at him and he's not looking at me he's not reacting to me he's walking towards the doe and then i snort wheeze and i'm trying not to call too much he's got deer under me and then he stops he turns and i'm able to pick up my binos he's got ears cupped looking at the food plot he sees the deer and he's just he won't move he's just looking he's just staring and i'm like man i wish i had a big buck decoy right here you know this moment but uh i've got two little bucks in front of me and a doe and so and then he just he wanted to go check that doe better so then he walked off and went on the river and and left and uh I'm like well there's a chance that doe just runs they just go the other way or there's a chance she might come in the food plot and I'm, I'm thinking he's she's about to come in the heat so he's he's probably gone for the night we see another five-year-old buck right before dark a couple other young bucks but a, a buck that gavin actually you and i filmed last year broken 210 oh yeah we saw him tonight nice. and uh he was just working straight out to the cut corner i mean he didn't come to the food plot we were on he's probably 100 yards off just on a dead just walk and 20 minutes to go i'm gr i grunt at him a little bit just to see if he would come over just to get a better look at him um not interested so we actually closed the hunt out 15 minutes of legal shooting left there's no deer in the plot there's no deer around they've all worked their way through and then the leaves are pretty crunchy right now so rye actually looks at me and says how much time we got left I'm like we got five minutes left and i hear leaves crunching and i hear them coming from the river and so I can't see him because it's dark in the timber. He hits the food plot and I'm like, it's a buck. I can tell with the naked eye, it's a buck. But I can't tell what buck it is. So I get him in the, in the binos. I'm like, it's him again. He's out here by himself in the food plot. And I look back at Rye, Rye's like, we're good on light. We're good. I'm like, okay. So let me get my bow. And, uh, and at the same time, more crunching. So there's, there's, there's bedding on the river, but then there's bedding kind of in the wetland where it's a bunch of young sycamore trees and it's super thick in there. And I can hear another, I'm like, it's another buck. Well, it's a little one and a half year old, but it's making noise when I'm like, what deer is this? It's just making so much noise. And Fitz magic is in the food plot, just waiting also to see what buck it is. Well, this buck, it's a young buck. He steps out and he crosses the food plot and comes to 20 yards under the stand. And I'm like, of course he's going to come walk over here but he doesn't, you know, the little buck just walks right to the base of the tree. And once he fits magic, sees what deer it is. He just, he just walks the edge of the food plot down the mowed lane. He's the only deer that has, I've ever seen do this. He's no deer did this tonight. You know, normally they filter through the food plot straight to the corn. Well, he wants to walk on the mowed lane, a uh, little miss Pris, but anyway, it's 57 yards across the, <laughs> it's 57 yards across the food plot. And, so I let him walk by. I've got my bow in my hand now. And he gets on the mode lane. And I tried just a light snort wheeze. He doesn't react. He's walking. It's loud. And so I do one grunt. He stops. And so I do a little snort wheeze. And he just immediately starts just, he's on the mode lane, just pawing the ground. 
I'm like, well, it still might happen. And then he kind of looks around and is like, man, and just kept walking. So <laughs> he's heading to where we hunted last night, which is where the main lane comes out of the central timber. There's a bunch of oak trees. There's a little green pot there. It's probably 400 yards from where we hunted tonight. But there's been 10 does there every night. And he's he just he just walked, just like broken two, just straight over there. It's also on the way to the cut corn. But it's crazy. You know, we, we were hunting DK saying – if we want to shoot Fitz magic, we might want to go hunt him and shoot him because he he's so active. He's on the farm every day, every day, every day. And he's, he's so killable and he won't be later. And, uh, anyway, it's everything beautifully worked out with DK. And then we go in there the first day and have three different encounters essentially with him in one day. And, uh, I'm sure we won't ever see him again, but you know, we're going <laughs> to we're gonna <laughs> stay after him and, Seeing him in person, uh, Aiden, that's what I was saying. Brian and I both said, like, man, that can't, the pictures don't do him justice. No. Like, I mean, he's a solid deer. And, and I was like, man, he's seven and a half. We need to shoot him. And then we seen him in person. I was like, man, he's, he's, a, he's a great deer. And so uh, we got even a little more excited um, for the chase. And so we'll see. I've got, I've got the next couple of days off. I've got to work on Monday. I've got a couple of days next week. So we'll be able to, we'll be able to stay after him and, I think the best is yet to come. You know, there's there's a lot a lot of rut to have here. So Man, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe someday we'll be able to talk about some success. <laughs> Maybe someday. <laughs> no, Josh, yeah. you just gotta go out and hunt, man. Yeah, no, I've I've got to do plenty of hunting, man. I, I I'm sorry, I shouldn't be complaining at all. I got to go to Georgia and had great experience down there. And then Brian Brown, uh, real tree films for real tree road trips and hunts there. He drew an Iowa tag and we've been bouncing around the public land, getting our tails whipped. And last night was my final hunt with him. Well, he called me tonight. He was pulling all his cameras off and there was one bean field that we were just like, man, we really should hunt here. And we just never did. I have no idea why, uh, really no logical reason. He pulled his cameras. It got late and he's like, I'm just going to go sit in the ground. And he said he saw two one forties and one fifties on this public land bean field. So, um, Certainly been in the woods, the deer, the drop time and that big nine for me, I've got a lot of little bucks. So it's basically my strategies turned from early where we had acorns. We had that big drop time, big nine, those acorns dried up, they disappeared. And so I've been really just putting a ton of effort in trying to pattern the does, figuring out what they're doing every day, because it's only a matter of time till bucks start to show up, you know, on them. And I've had a lot of small bucks show back up. Um, a lot of spikes, forkies, and then two of the good three or four year olds. I mean, obviously, I don't know how old they are being year one, but they're starting to move back in. So I'm banking that it's just going to be a matter of time. And that's what I was telling him. It's like, it's really hard to drive an hour and 35 minutes for a deer that you haven't had on camera for three weeks, but I don't really want to wait for them to make their pass through the farm and not be there. So, right. Yeah. 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 Um, hopefully, we can get out there and. You know? This time of year, you just go sit. I mean, if you get an opportunity to go sit, you never know what's going to happen, right? Exactly. But, yeah, November 3rd, we have got – man, we've, we're we having a pretty awesome season. I mean, it's so fun to get all the texts, all the calls. Hopefully, you guys out there with your, you know, friends and hunting buddies are getting to share in the same excitement that we are. For everybody who's taking the time to watch the episodes, we greatly appreciate it. Last week's show had Andy Melton and his son have an awesome hunt in Illinois over there. And I already talked about what's coming down the pipe. So for all of you guys taking the time to listen to this one, thank you very much. Continue to check out the daily blogs. Um, obviously, Mike just talked about that hunt that he had this evening with Fitzmagic. Rye is working on that currently. And then, you know, our Midwest Whitetail Regional Shows, three episodes a week, having some really good action come down the pipe there. We actually just aired an episode yesterday on the Great Plains Show that features Aiden's Encounter. So if you want to go check that out, you can. We also had team member Nolan Redeker have an awesome Kansas hunt. I mean, he saw his target buck, filmed some of the coolest buck behavior I've ever got to see, rubbing, scraping, comes right to the base of the tree. And let me tell you, that kid's got dedication to uh, <laughs> shooting his number one. Because the buck that was below him, like you said, Mike, good taxidermist, probably could have fixed his problems. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so super excited to see that. And then Corey Wolf actually was able to tag an awesome buck with his decoy there in Missouri. Kane Gillette, who was on podcast number four in mm -hmm. Illinois, his hunt aired tonight on the Heartland Show. And just again, guys, we're trying to bring as much, you know, 
punting action as we can your way. Please watch it from a standpoint of, you know, tactics. Ask us questions in the comments section. Our guys are really responsive. And then finally, one more mention. I mentioned on the front end of this episode, we're doing our Chasing November giveaway with Arctic Shield. All you got to do for super simple entry, go to their Instagram page, follow their link tree. They have a Chasing November giveaway section. Go and enter your information and then follow all the partners that were involved. And who knows, maybe you'll be the winner. So appreciate you guys tuning in. Good luck the next time you hit the woods. And we will see you back on the After Hours podcast next time.